people that don't engage in some form of resistance exercise already have one foot in the grave. Seriously. I mean, I'm not saying you have to go to the gym and work out three hours a day, but you got to do some form of resistant training to maintain muscle mass. Can't do it with aerobics. It has to be resistant training. Everybody, man, woman, I don't care who you are. They now know that. See, in the past, you have to understand, they downplayed resistance. They said, aerobic exercise, forget resistance. Ah, you don't need resistance. You got to do aerobic exercise to maintain your cardiovascular system if you want to live long. And, because cardiovascular disease is the number one killer. And they play down resistance training. Now they know they're equally important. You need both. Welcome to this week's episode of the Escape Your Limits podcast. Our guest today returns to answer more questions following one of our most popular episodes with half a million downloads. He has a distinguished background as a bodybuilder who trained alongside Arnold Schwarzenegger during the 70s. Beyond his achievements in bodybuilding, he boasts over 30 years of experience in researching and writing about all aspects of fitness, nutrition, and performance enhancing drugs. His remarkable career includes serving as the editor of Muscle and Fitness magazine, as well as being an editor at large for Flex magazine and Ironman for 28 years. In our last interview, he debunked the truth of steroids, bodybuilding, and the deathly effects of safe supplements. In this week's episode, we cover a number of subjects around nutrition and supplements, including the drawbacks of semaglutide and other fat loss burners as a weight loss solution, the only drug that's known to extend lifespan, and an in-depth discussion about the effects of creatine. So please welcome back the creator of Applied Metabolics, Mr. Jerry Brainham. Mr. Jerry Brainham. Hi, how are you doing, Matthew? It's good I'm, to see you again. I'm very good. We're in Venice Beach. Yes. Well, yeah. thanks for coming on. The last episode was very popular, nearly half a million views. Wow, that's great. So it was it was obviously got uh, got a lot of people's interest. We talked about steroids and yes. testosterone boosters and SARMs and growth hormones. So there's there's a there's a big interest in steroids, it seems. Sure. Oh yeah, I agree. <laughs> Huge and, interest. And and I thought we can follow on that, I guess, but yeah. um, maybe address some of the other questions that, that came out of that and then sure. we'll, we'll see where we go. So I, I, I wanted as a start to, to look at the supplements because I, I guess there's a, there's a close link. Like we, we talked about testosterone supplementation right. and, mm -hmm. and um, some of the- Testosterone boosters? Testosterone right. boosters, which are natural versions. And I, and yeah. I, and I, thought, I, I thought if we, if we kind of kick off from the supplement side, because one of the things that certainly came across was there's there's so much misinformation out there you know and so many gurus that yeah. talk about one thing and then people that, yeah. that absolutely contradict it and yeah. you 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 with your newsletter your your applied metabolics mm -hmm. that comes out you go into a lot of detail and That's a right. lot of research about some of this and I, I suppose the first question was how do you from your perspective separate the the, the 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 gurus out there that are talking and hyping up a lot of products and supplements and and the the information that you're finding out. How do you separate the two? Well, first of all, you have to look at the background of the person who is uh, pushing, let's say, a, a testosterone supplement. A lot of times they're selling the supplement, and there's obviously a conflict there, a con uh, ulterior motive. They're trying to make money. Uh, uh, what I do is I go by the research. Uh, and the research on testosterone boosters is, to put it in a single word, appalling, <laughs> meaning there's no research. There's animal research. I saw uh, a, uh, a, a person who calls him, well, I guess he is, he's a, a, a neurobiologist. From, uh, he has a podcast from Stanford University. Uh, he was recommending this stuff called fido fidocia. It's a, kind of an African herb. Now, the problem with that is... is that, that's Huberman, isn't it? The, Huberman, yeah, yeah, Huberman. I don't know the man personally. He seems like a nice guy. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that he's, uh, you know, he's pretty well respected because of his educational background. I wanna, I'll mention that in a second. But the point is, uh, I've caught him making a lot of errors. And uh, with him, you have a situation known in philosophy. Is, uh, it's called a logical fallacy. Appeal to authority, it's called. It's a it's a log, it's called a logical fallacy. What that simply means is a lot of people will take the word of somebody simply because of his educational background. They figure he must know what he's talking about. He's he's he yeah, has he's got a, one of the biggest sort of podcasts in the yeah area, yeah, so. yeah. Well, that's why yeah. because he's a so he's he's at Stanford University, a respected uh, you know educational institution, and they figure this guy uh, this is the expert. We're going to listen to him. 
Who's Jerry Brainham? I mean, where's his, where's his PhD? Is he teaching at Stanford? He, we're going to listen to Huberman. Well, a lot of what Huberman says is true. A lot of it he just picks out of the air. I just saw an article, not written by me, by somebody else, where they pointed that out, where he says things not based on any scientific credibility. In other words, he just, it's more or less his opinion. So is that, I, I know, because I've, I've followed some of the, there's, there's some interesting podcasts that he's done, and, and I know, you know, I'm not an expert, but he, he, he tends to refer to research and right. pull it together and then make uh, yeah. his view. Is that, is that kind of well, what you're referring to? He does refer to research, but what he doesn't mention, like with this Fedosia stuff, it was animal research. There was, wasn't a drop of human research. And, and he also, he has something in common with what I call the vegan advocates, you know, the people who make the pro-vegan videos. They will quote a lot of research, but they cherry-pick the research. They don't mention other research that conflicts with okay. their views. For example, again, relating to Fedosia, which is, again, an over-the-counter over testosterone booster, the rat studies show that it can also, uh, it, it can increase testosterone in rodents, yes, no human evidence, but even worse, it can also cause testicular damage. Now, if it did that in humans, it would have an opposite effect. It would not only not raise your testosterone, it would lower your testosterone. He doesn't mention that. Why do you think that's like, because he seems like a smart guy. Why do you think that would be missed out of? Is, I don't think, it... no, I don't think he's doing it maliciously. I can't explain why he doesn't mention it. Maybe he just doesn't think about it. I, I'm, sure he's, I'm sure he's probably read that. If he's read the studies on this stuff, he knows about this. Uh, I, and I, so what have you, where, where would you say you differ from other people? Not, not just sort of referring to Huberman as an example, yeah. but where would you differ when you look at the research? How do you, do you feel you get kind of a fairly balanced view on, okay. on, on both sides? Well, what I do is I have, I'm a little bit more open-minded, in other words, in a situation that... A lot of the problem is that a lot of natural substance, uh, substances or natural supplements might actually have utility in human physiology. But the problem is that because they're natural, there's not going to be a lot of human research on them because human research studies are extremely expensive. And the people that can afford to pay for that, which is pharmaceutical, big pharma, they're not going to pay for it because you can't patent these natural substances. So we have a situation where a natural substance might work, but we'll never know because there's no human confirmation. Now, a lot of, a lot of these substances, people will take them, especially the testosterone boosters and the nitric oxide supplements is another example. They'll take it and say, well, I know it works because I, hey, I, I feel I'm getting stronger, I'm getting bigger. Well, here we have what they call the placebo effect. In other words, it, uh, if you believe something's going to work, about 40% of the time it will. It's not necessarily from the substance you're taking, it's your belief because what happens is you subconsciously do things that stimulate real gains. Like if I give you a, a testosterone, say so you're a 25 year old guy, I'm giving, I, okay, Matthew here, you wanna get bigger, I'm giving you this testosterone uh, supplement, testosterone booster, and you're gonna get bigger, you're gonna grow, you're gonna grow like, you're gonna grow like you took steroids. So, okay, great, Jerry, you go to the gym, and you, because you, you're taking that now, you sub, subconsciously, you start training harder. You know you got the testosterone, so you're going to train more intensely. You're going to lift harder. You're going to maybe eat better. You're going to have more protein. That's where your gains are coming from, and you're going to wrongly attribute it to the testosterone booster, which probably did nothing. I've written about that in my applied myth about Tong Kat Ali, yeah. uh, but there's, there's, there's things you have to be aware of. Uh, this actual human studies, human studies, and, and these studies were paid for by, uh, by uh, uh, let's say, companies in Malaysia. Most of your Tongat Ali comes from Malaysia. And, you know, there's, there's a, a, you know, it's paid for, it's sponsored by the studies and by the government. So these are human studies. They're pretty good studies. They show that Tongat Ali does raise testosterone, but there's a caveat to that. And that is the fact that you have to have lower testosterone or, you know, in other words, if you already have normal to high levels of testosterone, Tonga Ali will do nothing. But if you have low testosterone, like let's say a man who's over 40 starting to get lower testosterone, Tonga Ali will actually bring up your testosterone level. Or if you're a younger man who's overtraining, 
Now, when you overtrain, you tend to lower your testosterone. If you don't get enough sleep, one night of not enough sleep, let's say six hours of sleep, five hours, six hours, you get a 15% drop in testosterone. Hmm. And a young man, For even, even young and old, or just yeah, young. it makes no difference. Wow. And you also get a buildup of certain abnormal proteins in the brain that can set you up for Alzheimer's. That's another story. But anyway, the point being that. It's conditional. In other words, Tonged Ali works, but it's conditional. Introducing the next big thing in functional training, the Escape Barrow, a revolutionary training tool that combines a loaded farmer's carry with a sled push to develop hip, grip, and core strength. Developed in partnership with Pete Holman, inventor of the TRX Rip Trainer and Nautilus Glute Drive, the Escape Barrow can be rolled, pushed, dragged and carried. The Escape Barrow packs a punch with an impressive load capacity of 440 pounds and with a two-stage galvanized paint covering process, it's also ideal for outdoor use. So head over to escapefitness.com forward slash barrow. That's escapefitness.com forward slash barrow to find out more. Enjoy the rest of this episode. So is, would, is Tonga Ali something you'd recommend then if you're overtraining and not sleeping well? Yeah, it would probably help. And in what way would you notice that? Like just more energy? Well, pro yeah, probably, uh, probably better gains because testosterone is needed for muscle growth. Probably better recovery. And you'd probably feel better. Yeah. Is there any downsides to, to that? No, not really. There's not. Uh, normal dosages, it's very safe. How do you find a good, because I, I guess there's a ton of them on the market. How do you then, so once you found that there's a particular supplement, and there's a few that I wanted to talk about here, mm -hmm. but let's say you find a, a Tonga Ali, listen to what you've said, it's like, okay, I can, I can supplement that. Then how do you go and find the brands that, a That's good a good and... question, a very good question, because it's funny that you mentioned Tonga Ali. There's a real, a real problem with herbal supplements because a lot of them aren't what they call standardized. What that means is when you get a drug or a medication because of the U.S., uh, I'm sorry, the Food and Drug Administration mandates that every pill, even generic drugs, have to have the same amount of active ingredient. Absolute necessity. Now, now herbs are not standardized, meaning that one pill can have more than the other, and you know there's a problem. And then, because Tangadali tends to be a little bit on the expensive side, the genuine Tangadali, you have a lot of knockoff fakes. So you don't know, even know if you're taking, that's a real problem. So the only thing I would recommend is to, if you're contemplating using Tangadali, contact the company, ask them for an, a lab analysis to prove that it's genuine Tonga Ali, because you could be buying, you know, God, who knows what's in there? It could be parsley or something. You know, it, might not, it might not be anything. Mm. So that's a, that's a real problem with herbal supplements is a lack of standardization. That's the biggest problem. One of the things I wanted to ask you about as it relates to supplementation is creatine. Ah, yeah. Um, I, I was interested in the history, and then is it good or bad and, and you know, your, your views on that, really. I, I think if you were to ask me the, the, to name the single most effective sports supplement in the world, I would unhesitatingly say creatine. It's effective for 80% of people who use it. Now, you're wondering, well, who are the other 20%? Well, people, creatine is found naturally in, in certain protein foods like meat and fish. If you are one of those people that habitually eats a lot of, let's say, red meat, let's say three or four times a week, you're getting creatine all the time. So you're kind of in a natural creatine load state. So if you take a supplemental creatine, you'll still get benefit, but not as much benefit as a person who doesn't eat as much meat. So, uh, so again, uh, it's, it's the single most effective supplement. Creatine- For, for what, just so I uh, it, it increases a, a number of things. It increases workout intensity. The basic function of creatine is you have a substance called the, the most elemental source of energy is called adenosine triphosphate or ATP. Now the, the way it works is ATP and, and the process of producing energy, one of the phosphate, it has three phosphates attached to it, adenosine, right? Just imagine three phosphates attached to adenosine. One, one of the phosphates breaks off, that's energy, right? Now that, now you have what they call adenosine diphosphate and then it can become adenosine monophosphate. 
Now, where creatine steps in, creatine can be, I compare it to like having an extra battery in your car. If your battery runs dead, the second battery takes over. What creatine does, it's stored in the muscle as creatine phosphate. So when the ATP is, is uh, let's say, degraded in the course of producing energy, the stored creatine muscle will donate the phosphate and actually you know, renew or replenish the ATP. Now, this process takes about two to three minutes. Now, this, this relates to working out because if you want maximum strength gains, you want to rest between sets two to three minutes. Why? Because mm. it takes two to three minutes to fully replenish the ATP. If you don't rest that long, you're not going to get the full replenishment and you're not going to have the strength and power. So that's it. That's what that's two what to three minutes, in. two to three minutes in between sets. Right. Okay. I'm going to come back to that point okay. in a minute, but carry on. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, anyway, creatine. A lot of people think it's new. You read, you asked about the history. Yeah. Creatine was actually discovered by a French researcher back in 1834. Yeah. They discovered in 1834, but nobody really knew what it did. You know, they really didn't have any idea. Uh, then it was researched uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, an interesting uh, uh, kind of side note to creatine is that around 1925, they, they published a study. Uh, uh, they looked at a stuff called creatine ethyl ester, which is a form of creatine that was not only a couple of years ago was released on the commercial market as being 400% better than normal creatine, right? Creatine ethyl ester is kind of uh, attached to an alcohol moiety, so supposedly it's absorbed better. Uh, but this 1925 study showed that creatine ethyl ester has no creatine effect whatsoever. <laughs> but, you know, th when the people re-released it as a creatine supplement, they left that part out. And, but then, unfortunately, a couple of other researchers, probably people who sell other types of creatine, took a, analyzed the effects of creatine ethyl ester. Sure enough, they found that after 30 minutes following oral, uh, oral ingestion, it's degraded into creatinine. Creatinine is the major waste product of creatine. A lot of people might have heard of creatinine because when you take uh, lab tests, one of the kidney tests is for creatinine because the body maintains a certain ratio of creatinine. And if the ratio gets too high, it's an indication of possible kidney damage or impending mm -hmm. kidney failure. That's a problem with that because if you do what they call a creatine load, which involves taking let's say 30 grams of creatine five to six days a week, and then you go to have a lab test, you, can have, you, you will show an elevated creatine, and the doctor will want you to take a, a kidney biopsy to make sure that you don't have damaged kidney, but you don't need it. It's from the creatine, see? So uh, it's been around, but... Uh, the... I remember in the sort of late 80s, <clears throat> um, that's when I first sort of remember people in the gyms using it. Actually, yeah, that's true, because what happened was in the 70s, East German and Russian athletes, they were the first. They were giving their athletes vials of creatine phosphate during competition. They were giving them vials of creatine phosphate. That was the first athletic use, but they kind of kept it to themselves. They didn't want the Western athletes <laughs> to know about it, so they kind of kept it, you know. They were also using androstendio, which is a later on became a pro-hormone, pro but they weren't giving the, and it was an early testosterone booster, but they weren't giving androstendio to the athletes to boost testosterone. They were doing it because androstendio increases aggression, uh -huh. and they wanted their athletes to be, aggression for, be aggressive for competition. But anyway, uh, it, so it, it turns out that uh, in the early 80s, a couple of companies started producing creatine. That's probably when you first heard mm -hmm. of it. Uh, a friend of mine, Bob Fritz, uh, was one of the first guys. I can't remember what company he was working for. He came out with the very, actually the very first commercial creatine supplement around 1985. But it didn't catch on. For some reason, it didn't catch on. I don't know why. I remember people, it, it, I remember it from the gym, and I remember people yeah. sort of mentioning that you used to, you would, you would sort of do it for a period and then stop, but, yeah. but you held a lot of water, I yeah, remember people right. saying. And then, so you didn't really gain anything. You just sort of blew up with water. And then when you stopped it, you went down. I don't, I was curious to know, like, in terms of muscle size, is, are you getting gains through the extra energy um, along with some sort of water retention or, or is it just all, you know, what, what, what's going on there? There is water retention, but it's intracellular. 
And that's good. What does that mean? And though it's the, it's, it, the water is held within the cells rather than external under the skin. Okay. You know, it doesn't give you a bloated look, in other words, but it does retain water, especially when you do it what they call the creatine load, which, I, as I said, involves taking about 25 to 30 grams of creatine five to six days and then going to a maintenance dosage of about maybe five grams after that. Uh, that will definitely uh, retain some water, but, you know, it's not just water because creatine stimulates uh, processes in muscle that build real muscle. For example, creatine stimulates a hormone called insulin-like growth factor one. When it's produced intramuscular, there's different forms of IGF-1. Some of it's produced in the liver through the release of growth hormone. Growth hormone, when it gets in the liver, it will stimulate the production of IGF-1. That's called systemic IGF-1. That maintains your heart your neurons in the brain, and your connective tissue, right? Now, this separate IGF-1, which is produced directly in muscle, it's produced when muscles damage. What it does is it stimulates the activation of what they call satellite cells. Mm. Satellite cells are muscle stem cells heavily involved in the repair and building of muscle. So when you take creatine, it actually stimulates intramuscular IGF-1, which in turn stimulates satellite cells that's real muscle. That's an anabolic effect, a direct. And secondarily, that water retention effect that we mentioned, the intracellular, you see, you don't want like a bodybuilder. He doesn't want extracellular water because it'll smooth him out. It obscures muscular definition. That's why they take diuretic drugs to get rid of that last bit of water. It makes them look super cut. It looks like they have see-through skin, translucent. But So you want to keep the water inside like stored in muscle, like each gram of glycogen is stored with 2.7 grams of muscle. That's why they do carbo-loading, to get more glycogen and more water in the muscle, which gives you a fuller-looking muscle. Now, but, but there's a secondary reason why you want intracellular water, because it has what they call a cellular swelling effect. In other words, when the water, when the cell is hydrated, it actually, it's, I know this sounds weird, it actually promotes anabolic signals it stimulates what they call myogenic factors that also help build muscle. So creatine works in that way too. Mm -hmm. So creatine is truly not only an, an energy producing suppl supplement because of its effect on ATP, but it also has a direct anabolic effect in muscle. That's why I consider it the number one, because it works. <laughs> it simply works for almost everybody who uses it. What do you do to find a good without sort of promoting any brand names? Yeah. Again, what do you, how do you how do you look for a good creatine? Because my guess is there's a lot of them out there. Yeah. Good bad. Well, uh, generally speaking, uh, there was a real problem with with uh, uh, a lot of the creatine uh, that was used in, in commercial supplements emanated from China. Now the problem with that, you probably already know what I'm about to say. China is famous for their poor quality control. Most of your amino acids come from China. Really? I'm not saying they're bad, but I'm saying it's, they don't use the, they, yeah. well, I'll give you a quick example to really make this clear. A couple of years ago, back in the, eight, I think it was the eight, late 80s, early 90s, did you ever have an amino acid called tryptophan? I've, I've heard of it. I... Okay, tryptophan is an essential amino acid. A lot of people take it because it's a precursor for a brain neurotransmitter called serotonin, which is involved in sleep. So they take serotonin, I'm sorry, they take tryptophan because it's rapidly converted in the brain into serotonin, helps you relax, helps you get to mm. sleep, right? Okay, it turns out that most of your, as I said earlier, most of your amino acids were coming from China. Well, the Chinese decided to use a new process involving, see the way they produce amino acids is through f bacterial fermentation process. <clears throat> they tried it, they decided to use a new filtering system to produce tryptophan, which would lower the cost of producing it. Unfortunately, this new filtering system turned out to be inefficient and it left some contaminants in the, uh, in the tryptophan, that, and they didn't know this was happening. It was released, released onto the market. They later identified the contaminant was called peak E, and it caused a disease called eosinophilia myalgia, where, which, where a lot of people, about 300 people, got very sick because of the tryptophan, causing the government to pull all tryptophan supplements off the market. Strangely, it was left in baby food. 
they were still allowed tryptophan. Right. To, could, could you figure that out? You would think babies are the most, you know, <laughs> susceptible, but they said the babies can still have tryptophan, but everybody else can't have it. Anyway, once they identified, they straightened it out, and it's, tryptophan today is very safe. There's no problem. My point is, though, that I tell you that anecdote to illustrate the problem with, with uh, China is that in, in, the, in, the, in regard to uh, uh, creatine, uh, their creatine also has been found to have impurities. Be again, because of pure pro uh, bad processing, uh, the, the type of impurities is a little bit shocking. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people are startled. They're forms of cyanide, which of course is a poison. Now, quickly, let me quickly add, I'm not saying if you take Chinese creatine, <laughs> it's going to kill you. But what you will feel is a lot of people who've taken creatine, they say they get nauseous. They don't feel good. It's probably, that's your sign that you're using a cheap, crappy grade of creatine. The best creatine, actually, again, without, well, I'll name a, a, a generic name. It's called Crea Pure, Crea Pure. It's from a company in Germany. That is the purest creatine in the world. There's a couple other companies in the United States that also make very good grades of creatine. But, you know, there's no reason why a person taking a creatine supplement should have bloating or, or, or gastrointestinal issues. If you're having them, there's something wrong with your creatine. Creatine does not do that unless it's a poor quality. That's your tip off. And recommended dosage, like obviously it depends on the quality in that, but are you, are you, is it something that you take all the time? Uh, I, know, I know in my pre-workout, which I'm gonna come on to in a minute, mm -hmm. it's got creatine in, so mm -hmm. how, is it, do you have to sort of phase on and off if, because it might do some harm? Or what, what, are, you, what are you recommending? You know, another good question, because uh, creatine uptake is determined <clears throat> by something called the tr creatine transport protein within muscle. <clears throat> when creatine was first introduced in the 90s, uh, you know, that's when it first became popular, uh, they were advised, uh, you, you were advised to take creatine with a large amount of rapidly absorbed carbohydrate. They were make, recommending as much as 95 grams of carbohydrate for each teaspoon or five grams of creatine. Now, that's a lot of carbohydrate. Now, you say to me, why carbohydrate? Because carbohydrate stimulates insulin, especially a rapidly absorbed form of carbohydrate. Insulin, in turn, stimulates what they, it gets a little complicated, it stimulates what's called the potassium sodium pump in cells. This, in turn, <laughs> it's, it follows, it's one thing following another. That in turn turns on what they call the creatine transport protein, and that pushes the creatine into the muscle. So they, they, later on, though, they found that it's not even insulin that you need. It's actually, if you really want to turn, on, turn it on, sodium. Because sodium actually turns on the sodium pump. You know, it makes sense, doesn't it? But you don't, have to, you don't have to take salt with your... The normal amount of salt in the diet is plenty. You don't have to have added salt. And they discovered that just taking creatine with a quick-acting protein like whey, because whey, some of the amino acids in whey are absorbed fast enough to stimulate a, a substantial release of insulin, and that also will push the creatine. You don't need to take any carbohydrates. Now, one issue that came out related to what you were saying, when creatine first came on the market, they realized how creatine is absorbed through this creatine transport protein, and the theory was that if you continue, if you use creatine on a continuous basis without, let's say, uh, cycling it or getting off, you would tone down the creatine transport protein. You know, this has to do, see, like, for example, when you take testosterone, you know, your, test your androgen receptors, this happens with a lot of receptors in the body. If you take something continuously, your body senses it and, the and it, it downgrades the receptors. It's kind of a, prote a protective device of the body, a uh, device of the body. It doesn't want you to get messed up. So they thought that by taking uh, creatine continuously, it would turn off the creatine transport protein and your creatine would all go to waste. Now they know that's not true. A couple of years later, they realized you can take creatine all the time. Hmm. You know, you don't have to cycle. If you want, you could cycle it. Now, there is one, again, caveat to that. <clears throat> the, one of the controversies about creatine is that, you know, remember I mentioned that the major byproduct of creatine metabolism is called creatinine. Now, creatinine, again, is, is uh, excreted by the kidneys. Uh, there is a certain segment of the medical population, let's call it, that believes that excess creatinine from creatine is harmful to the kidneys. 
and they claim that using creatine all the time eventually will cause kidney damage. But th there's no real evidence of that. However, if you have some sort of pre-existing, this is an important point, not normal kidneys, if you, let's say, take lab tests and you show a little bit off-kilter kidney, and this is a little more common when you get past 40, it probably would be a good idea to cycle the, kid, uh, the uh, creatine just as, a, as an insurance measure. You probably don't need to, but just on the safe side, it would probably be a good idea to take creatine. Uh, if you get off creatine, creatine stays stored in your muscles for 30 days once it's loaded. So you'd have to take, uh, get off creatine at least two months for it re uh, you return to baseline levels. Then you could go back on again. Oh, how would that, because you mentioned it's in meat and fish. <coughs> so if you eat that regularly, I guess you maintain a baseline and you'd have to almost like stop eating that, that as well, would you? Or? No, no, you could, you, could, you could still eat. I'm talking about, uh, you see, they have to say the creatine supplements are much more concentrated. Okay. One uh, teaspoon of, uh, of creatine, which is five grams, uh, that equals the amount of creatine found in, in, uh, in uh, four pounds of meat. Right. So you'd have to eat a lot of fish. Now, if you're eating, uh, let's say, sardines, which, uh, if I remember correctly, I forget whether it's sardines or anchovies, one of the two, is the number one actual food source of creatine. It's, it's not red meat, it's the fish. One of those is the richest source of creatine. If you were to eat five or six, maybe seven pounds a day of that fish, then you'd have a problem because you'd still t that's like you're still taking a lot of creatine. Mm. To my knowledge, most people don't like fish that much, <laughs> unless you're an Eskimo somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and and with um, with that, it is would would it be fair to say then that if you did have a pretty good diet, that your body does need it, you use it, but you you, you want to be sort of fairly careful in terms of how much over and above you take uh, outside of good food. You oh, you know, mean so the creatine supplement itself? Uh, yeah, yeah, because. Um, Remember, your body, your body, for example, makes one gram of creatine a day. It's, it's made from the three amino acids, methionine, glycine, and arginine. Those are the precursors for creatine. It's made in the liver, kidney, and pancreas. So even if you take no creatine, your body will still produce one gram of creatine. Because like I say, it's essential to health. It really is. Even though it's not considered an essential nutrient, it really is important. Uh, but the point being that... that uh, the average person, if they eat some of the creatine foods like meat and fish, will get another gram. So they're taking an average of, let's say, producing in their body, one gram in the body, one gram outside, two grams a day, right? Now, it turns out that's what the body is basically used to. So if you take five grams, which is a teaspoon, you're already taking kind of a mega dose of creatine, mm. right? Now, if you start, now they have, like I said earlier, they have what they call a creatine load. That was the first way creatine was suggested to be taken when it first came out. Again, you take five grams, which is a teaspoon, about five to six times a day for five to six days. And then you go back to maybe about a teaspoon after that. And the, the idea was that you load your muscles with creatine. Subsequent research over the years showed that, it's, that after 48 hours, but you have to understand 30, let's say 25 to 30 grams a day, which is what you'll be taking in the load, that's a massive amount. That's like 25 to 30 times more than your body ever makes. Your body's not used to that. So what they found is after 48 hours on a creatine load, more than 50% of the creatine is being excreted right out. It's wasted. So in other words, the best way to take creatine, based on my research, is to take no more than 5 grams. If you take 5 grams, 1 teaspoon, in 30 days, you'll have the same amount of creatine loaded in your muscle as if you did a one-week load, and you will, not, you will not be wasting any of the creatine, and you will not get the water retention that comes in. Because with the load, you do get water retention. You know, you, that, and like I say, even though most of it's internal, if you're, let's say, a track athlete or somebody that's dependent on not having a lot of extra weight, it could be detrimental. So you, you, if you take the one teaspoon a day for 30 days, there's no problem with the bloating or the water, water retention. Right. Pre-workout, mm -hmm. what are your views on this? And I want to start with one that's, that I, I was listening to one of your videos and you talk about um, this as being a pre-workout, which is caffeine. Caffeine, uh, yeah. So we'll start with one which is sort of fairly natural and then I'll probably go on to some of the others. But what, what are your... What are your views on, on caffeine? Uh, what, are the, what studies have you seen on it? Is, mm. it? is it a good 
pre-workout, are there any risks of, right. of taking too much? Yeah. Okay, I'll let you in a little secret now that supplement companies don't want people to know. Almost every pre-workout that I've seen, at least 99% of them, the, one of the main ingredients is always caffeine. <laughs> and guess what the most active ingredient is in the pre-workout? Caffeine. So when you buy a pre-workout, most of them, you're basically paying for an expensive form of caffeine. Expensive you, coffee. Yeah, expensive <laughs> coffee, exactly, right. So I'm not saying that the other stuff in the pre-workout doesn't do anything, but the main active ingredient is caffeine. There's a ton of evidence. It goes way back. One of the first researchers to show ergogenic, mean, ergogenic meaning improving work performance was a, 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 a researcher named David Coastal who showed that taking caffeine actually spares muscle glycogen. It, it tends to cause your body to use more fat as a source. It causes your fat cells to release fat, stored fat more readily. And the reason caffeine does that is because it stimulates chemicals in the body called catecholamines, noradrenaline and, and norepinephrine. These uh, stimulate a enzyme on fat cells called hormone-sensitive lipase, which causes the stored triglyceride fat to be break down into the component of fatty acids and glycerol, and it's released in the blood. And if you exercise and break, take in some oxygen, like aerobics, you will oxidize that fat. You'll burn it up. So by utilizing the fat, Coastal found that you spared, see, the you limited amount of glycogen storage, unlike fat, is very limited. You only have a certain amount of the liver, a certain amount of muscles. Uh, if you don't eat food for something like 24 hours, you exhaust all your glycogen because your body will be taking the glycogen stored in the liver and the muscles and using it because you're not taking in glucose. It'll be gone. That's what happens when people fast. That's why if you go on, let's say, you know, the popularity of intermittent fasting, if you really want an effect, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people will fast for 16 hours. You, that's not going to exhaust your glycogen. You, you got to go 24, 48 hours. And you won't even get, and another reason they go, I, I, I don't mean to go off, veer off the topic, but one of the main uh, reasons why people also do intermittent fasting is a process called autophagy, which involves the getting rid of old cells and allowing new cells to, to uh, reproduce. Autophagy only takes place when glycogen is, is gone too. So these short intermittent fasts, I mean, I'm not saying they're bad and they don't do anything, but you're not getting much autophagy and you're not, and you're still on your muscle glycogen. So you're not going to get much ketones. Ketones are only released when glycogen is exhausted, like on a zero carbohydrate diet. So coming back to the pre-workout there, yeah. um, caffeine is good. Caffeine is definitely good because it, it does help. Uh, it really does. There's an extensive body of research showing it does stimulate fat mobilization. Now, you notice I didn't say fat oxidation. That's where people get confused. They hear the word fat mobilization. They think, oh, it, it burns fat. No, fat mobilization only means that caffeine, as I said earlier, helps you pull the stored fat out of the fat cells into the blood. But to oxidize it, you got to do something. You can't just sit there and burn fat. It's not going to happen. You got to move. You got to exercise. You got to do aerobics. You got to take in oxygen. Fat burns in the presence of oxygen. But so, but caffeine is a superior fat mobilization that does work. Nobody argues that. I mean, there's a lot of controversy in nutrition. Nobody argues that particular point about caffeine. I like that statement. <clears throat> actually, I'll use that. Fat yeah. burns in the presence of, of oxygen. Oxygen and yeah. movement. <laughs> yeah, movement. You got to move. That's what people. You know, they, people take these fat burners and they sit and watch Netflix. Net, <laughs> uh, Netflix. That's the Chicken Channel. No, I meant Netflix. In other words, they, they watch this. Uh, you know, they, they sit there with the clicker and they take the fat burner. Oh, I'm burning fat. They're not burning fat. You know what they're doing? If the, if the supplement contains caffeine. The caffeine is causing the fat to be released out of the fat cells, but because they're not doing anything to oxidize it, the fat circulates in the blood and goes right back into the fat cell. They call it re-esterification is the scientific term. Just goes right back in the fat cell. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the other one, um, so, so what, is, um, what is citrulline? Citrulline is a, uh, I call it the uh, better form of arginine. Citrulline is a uh, non- uh, let's say, a non-muscle protein. In other words, it's not incorporated. It, unlike other, it's an amino acid. But unlike... And they have it in, it's in pre-workouts. So. Yes, it's in pre-workouts, and I'll tell you why. 
It's it's not it's it doesn't well actually I have to I have to try I was just going to say it doesn't unlike essential amino acids it's not involved in muscle building but recently studies show that it actually stimulates a substance called the mammalian target of rapamycin or mTOR that's the pivotal substance stimulated by exercising amino acids and steroids that builds muscle it stimulates muscle protein synthesis so citrulline actually does help build muscle but the main use is the fact that it's a superior form. It's found naturally in watermelon. In fact, the word citrulline is taken from a Latin word meaning watermelon, <laughs> believe it or not. So it's found in a couple of other foods, but citrulline, the problem with arginine is that arginine, uh, you have an enzyme called arginase. It's in the gut, it's all over. The, when you take oral arginine, 40% of the dose is immediately degraded by, uh, by arginase. And, uh, so you only get a smaller percentage into the blood. Now, when you take citrulline, uh, it's not acted on by arginase. What happens is it travels to the kidneys. I'm talking oral uh, citrulline. The kidneys reconvert it back into arginine. Now, once the arginine gets in the blood and meets up with the what they call the nitric oxide synthesizing enzyme, it's called endothelial nitric oxide synthesis, ENOS. Once it meets up with that, Boom, it's converted right into nitric oxide, and you get you know, the widening of the blood vessels, increased oxygen delivery of the muscles. That's why it's put in pre-workout supplements. It's a, it's a good nitric oxide precursor, right. and it's very safe. It's very safe. And, and, and nitric oxide, mm -hmm. that is, a, is generally a byproduct, or do you, or do you take, take that? Is there a way to... You can't take nitric oxide directly, because nitric oxide... Is, uh, hold on. Nitric oxide is a gas. Yeah. It's very ephemeral. In fact, there's an interesting story about that real fast. Uh, for years, they, uh, scientists knew there was something produced in the body that dilated blood vessels, but they couldn't identify it because they couldn't isolate it. It would appear and be gone. And they, so they named it endothelial relaxation factor. Endothelial relates, is, is, is the word for the endothelium, which is the lining of blood vessels. This particular substance was able to relax the smooth muscles in blood vessels, and by doing that, it widened the blood vessels, and at the same time, it lowered the blood pressure. It maintained healthy blood pressure. But scientists couldn't figure it out. They couldn't isolate it. It was a freaking gas. It was released and gone in five seconds. It's like trying to catch a ghost. It was ephemeral. You couldn't catch it, right? It turns out a couple of uh, scientists figured out that the byproduct of nitric oxide were nitrates, 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 nitrite and nitrates. And they realized that, that your, the, the, uh, the, the level of nitrates that were produced was an indication of nitric oxide release. By doing so, don't ask me how, it was very complicated. They were able to figure out that endothelial relaxation factor is in fact nitric oxide. Now... You can't, again, take a nitric oxide supplement because, again, it, it's a gas. It's gone. It's, it'd be, you know, like I say, is it's it like... In, is it, it does, does beetroot produce? Be, it, yeah, beetroot, beetroot does because it's a natural, it's a great natural source of nitrate. And the nitrate, once we, if you drink, let's say, beetroot juice, the first step you have uh, certain bacteria in your mouth that have, secrete enzymes that start the conversion of nitrate found in beetroot juice into nitrite. Then you swallow the, 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 you know, the nitrite that's now initially converted by the oral bacteria, gets into the gut, further enzymes convert the nitrite into nitric oxide. It's an it's a alternative method to amino acids like arginine and citrulline. Those are your two ways of boosting nitric oxide. You can either take citrulline or arginine, or you could take uh, what they call nitrate, nitrate containing vegetables. For example, again, beetroot juice, beets, uh, what's the other one? Spinach, there's a couple of them. They're rich in nitrate. Uh, the only thing you have to be careful of, certain antiseptic mouthwashes uh, will kill the bacteria mm. that start the initial conversion and they'll kind of short circuit the whole thing. Uh, it turns out that uh, you'll know because they'll, they'll say antiseptic uh, mouthwashes. So you want to, if you're taking these vegetables, you want to keep your mouthwash a couple of hours away because you'll short circuit it if you think, yeah. With, <clears throat> with pre-workouts then, because there's a lot of <clears throat> ones that, I, that don't feel good. I, I've, yeah. I've tried a few, some feel good, some feel mm -hmm. don't. But what, what's the, 
again, recommended way that you can separate a good from a bad. You've mentioned a few things that are in it, caffeine, mm -hmm. citrulline. Like, how, how do you, how did you, you, when you're looking at online or on the shelf, how, how are you going to go about choosing a good one then? Well, you want to probably go with some proven ingredients like the caffeine, citrulline, beta alanine is another good ingredient. Uh, creatine would, would be useful. Uh, that type of thing that, you know, uh, the, the, the problem in my mind with uh, pre-workout supplements is, you know, there's a line from the, one of the original, uh, what was it, uh, the Tom Cruise movie, uh, what was that? Top Gun. Top Gun. <laughs> the need for speed. You remember that line, the yeah. need for speed? A lot of people have a need for speed. In other words, they like to feel, ah! you know, they, like, they, like, they want to feel like that before they work out. Yeah. So <clears throat> unfortunately, some of the pre-workouts, and this is what you want to avoid, they have dug out these long abandoned amphetamine compounds that were, came out in the 40s. Some of them were used as like nasal, you know, to, to shrink nasal pit, but they caused too many problems. They ra tended to raise the blood pressure way too high, way too fast, the opposite of nitric oxide. So they were abandoned. But some of these companies, because they're, meth they're basically methamphetamine, they like speed, they're a the form of methamphetamine. They added it to the supplements. Uh, one of them was called DMAA. Now, when they started using this, a couple of people, you know, you know, there's an old saying, a lot of people uh, will take a supplement. If it says, take one scoop, they'll take, well, one scoop feels good. <laughs> I'm going to take three and maybe four. I'll be, have that much more energy. Problem is, now you're overdosing. And if it has something like DMAA in it, now you're in trouble. Because now you could raise your blood pressure high enough to cause a stroke. And that's actually happened. It happened to a couple of military people where the U.S. Army banned the uh, pre-workout supplements that contain this stuff. Because it, it's, uh, that, the, again, the problem, you've got to be careful these pre-workout. Uh, if it has stuff on the label, you know, some of these, D there's a couple of others. When, they got trying, when, when the news came out about DMMA, the companies replaced it with other amphetamines. They wanted to keep the money coming in. They, they know that these guys wanted that speed that effect, yeah, you know. Yeah. So they substituted the DMA for other uh, amphetamines. So they're still out there. And you want to avoid these kind of things, you know. You be careful. If it has some of these chemical names you're not familiar with, don't use it. Because, again, you know, if you take stick with the regular scoop and you don't have pre-existing cardiovascular problems like high blood pressure, you'll probably be okay but if you take more than one scoop or you forget or you take it several times a day, even if you're a healthy person, you could be in big trouble. Mm, okay, good advice there. Yeah. Fasting, you mentioned about fasting. I was, there's, there's, there's a lot of conversation around about this and, yeah. and I'm a little bit confused. I've tried different things myself. Yeah. Um, I, I, the, the first question is, is really about intermittent fasting. Mm. And you, you mentioned uh, that you're not really getting um, you're not really getting a lot of benefits until you've got rid of your glycogen. So yeah. what, what, what's your views on intermittent fasting? When is it relevant, if at all? And, and how would you, um, you know, how, how would that link into if you wanted to actually train to build muscle? Well, uh, that's a good question because recent studies, uh, when the intermittent fasting first became popular, a couple of studies showed that only certain forms of intermittent fasting, meaning the longer forms, the ones that were on, let's say, more than a day or two, they were definitely adverse uh, as far as building muscle. They tended to produce catabolic effects in muscle. Uh, there was one called a time-framed, uh, I, I think, I can't remember the exact term. It's where you only eat within a certain time frame, mm -hmm. let's say between seven... Time-restricted. Time-restricted, yeah. that's it. Time-restricted. That one originally was found to be the best for somebody that wanted to build muscle, Unfortunately, another study came out recently showed that that also can interfere with muscle gains. So, you know, there's a little bit of a problem with that. Uh, I, I, I kind of like have a little bit of doubts about that because if you follow a, let's say, 16-hour intermittent fast... I do a 16-8 just that's because good, it's yeah. convenient. That's and... fine. That's fine. But in other words, as long as you get a good amount of protein within a short time of breaking the fast... I don't think you're going to have major catabolic. I think it's nonsensical. I think it's bull. I don't believe that for a second. Now, you're not again, you're not going to get the major autophagy effect unless you do it for more than a, at least a day, maybe two days. Uh, again, you've got to exhaust all the glycogen to get into that. 
Uh, you got to release this stuff called AMPK is involved in that, that stimulates autophagy. But uh, a short-term uh, uh, intermittent fast, <clears throat> for some reason, even if you do like you're doing, is really good for the immune system. Right. It kind of resets it. So, you know, that alone makes it worthwhile. Uh, the, uh, a lot of people will use intermittent fasting as a means of weight loss. Now, recent studies that compared intermittent fasting to your, let's say, normal calorie counting showed no difference. In other words, it's the same rate of weight loss. Why? Because a lot of people will go on a fast, and when they break the fast, they pile <laughs> the food in, so they're winding up getting the same amount of calories, even though they've restricted some calories by the fasting, by loading up on the food afterwards, in the long run, they're getting the same amount of calories as a low-calorie diet, so they're in the same boat. Yeah. You know, and so the, so, but it's, it's a good thing. I, I generally think that, uh, that it's, 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 good for, it's good for health. Uh, some, some earlier studies showed that intermittent fasting could provide up to 90% of the health benefits of what they call calorie restriction eating. Calorie restriction involves reducing your daily caloric intake by 30, average of 30%. Now, that's a lot. And animals ranging from mice to rats to fish to dogs to even monkeys, they showed that calorie restriction tended to produce a life extension effect. Uh, uh, a couple of humans have, there's no human evidence, you have to understand. To get human evidence, you'd have to follow a person their entire lifespan. No, that would be a, a study that would be the mother of all studies from an expense. <laughs> Even Elon Musk would back off on that one. And that's how expensive that would be. And nobody's going to do it anyway. But the point being that, uh, uh, you know, there's not, there's not a lot of evidence that it'll do that uh, ex and extend life. But the point is that they found that following a uh, intermittent fasting does provide a lot of the benefits of caloric restriction uh, because, again, effect on the immune system uh, does have a good effect on lowering resting insulin levels, lowering glucose levels. These are all related to increased longevity. So, in other words, if you're interested in, let's say, long-term health, intermittent fasting is still a good idea. Mm. Just don't depend on it for fat loss. It's not the greatest fat loss thing. Right. So, so muscle building then, because I guess, and we're going into a few different areas now, but I guess muscle building generally probably isn't, something for longevity like you don't actually need a lot of big muscle if oh, you no. want to live a long time so no. are those two things so if you if you do want to do intermittent is it negative to muscle building or if you know providing you don't do it for extended periods you can still maintain even as you get a little bit older a certain amount i think of you I, I think you could maintain but i just want to comment on what you just said about the large muscles as you get older the big problem with that is a again remember i, I mentioned that that substance earlier called mTOR, the million target of rapamycin. There's a problem when people age, there's a balance between mTOR and this stuff called AMPK. Now remember I mentioned autophagy, which is a very healthy process where your body gets rid of old cells. It's definitely related to longevity. AMPK stimulates autophagy, mTOR blocks it. And the problem is as mm. people age, mTOR gets out of balance. How does that happen? It just, it just, it, nobody really knows. It just, it just, your, your body just produces, it, uh, tends to produce less AMPK to balance out the mTOR, and the mTOR tends to get out of balance. At, with, so, what's, at, so if you have too much mTOR, is that a bad thing? Very bad, because it stimulates, not only does it cause more rapid aging, it stimulates cancer and cardiovascular disease and brain degeneration. Right. So it's very bad. Now, imagine a guy, let's say 50, 60 years old, still involved in bodybuilding, uh, you know, he might be having a, a rise in mTOR, and he's taking amino acids, which stimulate mTOR. He's, uh, he's involved in weight training, which stimulates mTOR. And maybe he's even taking testosterone, which also stimulates <laughs> mTOR. So there's a real problem there. They say, well, is that a dead man walking? No. <laughs> there's things you could do about it. Very simple. What you do to counter mTOR is raise AMPK. There's a lot of nutritional that. supplements can do that. And guess what? When you do aerobic exercise, AMPK goes right up. Really? Right up. When you take in, uh, uh, if you take in carbohydrates, uh, right, let's say after your workout, M M AMP AMPK rises. If you take substances like green tea, certain other substances, 
AMPK rises. So if, if <clears throat> I'm just going to do a visual, so so let's say you're, so let's say you're 60, okay, yeah. and, to, and you are doing weight lifting. You want to maintain a certain amount of muscle mass, which is good, I guess. Right, sure. And you've got you've got like mTOR up here yeah. and M AMPK there. Mm. So if you let's say you do some cardiovascular stuff, does that sort of D does that push this up and then M so so you, you're kind of raising both levels right um, the, the protein will the weight training will raise uh, mTOR mTOR and protein will raise it the uh, aerobics will raise AMPK okay all right so but if if let's say you weren't doing that you've got a certain so so what are you, are you is it kind of like I'm trying to sort of explain this but are you is the goal even if you've got a reasonably high level of mTOR through weight lifting uh -huh. and testosterone is the goal to really boost the AMPK yes. above that which can be done or, or to to offset that right. which can be done through other ways yes that's to what you balance want to, it out that's the key you okay. want to balance it you don't necessarily have to have a, a super high AMPK because AMPK Blocks muscle protein synthesis, which so is what happens when you're younger. Then, like, are, are you, do you have both of those things in balance? Yeah, you tend to be automatically in balance. You don't have to worry. About it it right. only rises with age. I'm not really sure why, but it rises with Mentor, age. That yeah. Is. Now, an interesting uh, side note to this is the only drug thus far produced which is known to extend lifespan even in middle-aged people. Now, you have to understand. I mentioned calorie restriction increasing the lifespan of animals. Very bad, sad fact about that is for that to happen in humans, you'd have to start it in infancy. And that, that would cause growth retardation. No, no one in their right mind is going to do that. Mm. But they discovered a drug that actually you could start at 40 or 50 years old and it will work. It will actually lower M mTOR. And by doing so, it extends lifespan. It's pretty certain that it does. It's called rapamycin. Rapamycin was discovered. It's called rapamycin because the, the native name of Easter Island is Rapamimui or something like that. And this stuff was discovered in the, uh, it was like a fungus growing in the soil on Easter Island. They isolated this stuff, made it into a drug called rapamycin. Rapamycin is used medically as an immunosuppressant. They give it to people who have kidney uh, transplants to prevent the rejection of the kidney because it downgrades your immune system. But it also inhibits mTOR. So a lot of people right now are taking, including some of the people that you've seen on these videos, uh, you know, they're taking smaller doses, maybe six milligrams of rapamycin twice a week in the hopes of, and these are older guys, of getting the life extension benefits. Now, I thought about that myself. In fact, I read of a study where when they give it to dogs, it extends the lifespan of dogs an average of three to four years. And I said, gee, I got to get a hold of it and give it to my dog. <laughs> you know? some doggy, doggy, doggy gummies. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's an actual ongoing study where they're giving rapamycin to dogs. It's going on even as we speak. But anyway, uh, the thing is, I thought about it. And then I said to myself, I, I looked at the side effects. First of all, it's an Im immunosuppressant is rapamycin, right? Mm. And then I, even with the small doses, in this age of COVID, you know, and all these people walking around with diseases, do you really want to take something that's going to depress your immune system? No, I'm not, I don't think so. So I, I chose not to take rapamycin. My technique is to do exactly what I said earlier, to try and alternate raising my AMPK. AMPK. And at other times when I want to maintain the muscle, I raise my mTOR. I do that by taking amino acids, protein, and weight training. And, and do you, is, this some, is this a balance that you do like on a daily basis? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't consciously say, well, well now I'm going to do, uh, at 3 o'clock, I'm going to take my no. no, it's just a, a natural. Also, I take a drug called metformin, which is used for prediabetes. Uh, it also happens to be a very potent AMPK stimulator. That alone, if, if, even if I did nothing else, that would raise my AMPK. Unfortunately... Because it raises AMPK, it also interferes with muscle gains. A lot of people will tell you, don't take metformin on the days you work out because it's going to block your muscle gains. So how do, you, how do you sort of balance those <coughs> two? Because it's, it sounds like it's quite complicated. To, like, is there a general rule of thumb that you can... Because obviously you want the mTOR because yeah. you want to build it, but you yeah. don't want too much and right. you want the AMPK to keep it under control yeah. without some sort of sophisticated measurement tool. How, how do you... How do you figure that out? Well, what I do these days is I focus on 
basically trying to boost AMPK a little bit more than mTOR. In other words, I take in protein, I work out with weights, but at this stage of the game, I'm not concerned with trying to build 20-inch arms or anything like that. I'm more interested in health and longevity, and if, I, and if raising AMPK will tend to promote that, that's what I'm going to focus on. If I was younger, I would probably be the opposite, meaning I would definitely, let's say I was in my 20s, early 30s, then the, I, would, I would reverse the focus. Now it would be on mTOR. I wouldn't even be concerned about AMPK. It's only when you get older that so you So what have, sort of age are we talking? About 40s, I'd say well, I, a little older than that, about 50, 50, 50 right. 55. Right. You, right. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm, so when I work out, I'll do, um, I, I kind of always start my workout with a, with a bit of like a run. I like mm -hmm. running outside, not too long, but 20 minutes cardio, and then I'll do my weights. And mm -hmm. I know probably not the right way of doing it, but I'm, when I'm doing my cardio, is that sort of something, is that raising my AMPK? And yeah. then when I'm doing my weights, I'm, I'm sort of... It is raising your AMK, AMPK, but, but uh, uh, I don't think it's going to really interfere that much with, uh, with, the, with the gains, because as soon as you start, as soon as you start to lift the weights, the, it's going to reverse. But would that balance? Would that help to sort of balance it? Yeah, it if would. I didn't do any. Yeah, no, it, it would definitely help to balance it. Uh, but as soon as you start to lift the weights, you're going to get the message. Your body's going to send out a signal to boost the air because you're, you're, you know, you're, you're basically working your muscles. You'll get a kind of signal to, to kick out mTOR. mTOR. Yeah, so there'll be no problem. There's no real problem. The biggest problem with doing aerobics prior to resistance training is that if you do it too much. Let's say you do an hour, you're going to exhaust the glycogen that should be because you have to understand resistance exercise. The number one fuel is muscle glycogen. Mm -hmm. You know, you might have heard the term hitting the wall. You know, some of these runners, long distance, when the glycogen <laughs> runs out, they, you know, they, 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 they're like they, they can't even move. The muscles seize up, basically. Yeah. I mean, it never happens with weight training, but still, in other words, the, the only problem I see with doing aerobics first is that you know, you'll be using some of the glycogen that might be used in the resistance. That's the only problem. Right. But, is, but, I, but is, as, a, as a simple kind of takeaway from this, particularly as me, as I'm in my sort of mid-50s almost, um, mm -hmm. do some cardio because yeah. that's going to assist with the AMPK. That's right. Um, do your strength training and everything else. And is there any other supplementation to you know, for that AMPK as well? Because it seems as though if you're taking protein and amino yeah. acids and working out, you've, you've got your mTOR yeah. figured out. Yeah, there's a couple of them. Like I said, green tea, green tea. curcumin. Uh, it's a couple of them. I can't remember them offhand. There's about 10 of them right. that actually will raise AMPK. I don't remember. Those okay. are the only two I remember up here. And then coming back to the original thing, which was fasting then. And, and so does the, does the uh, intermittent or... Or any kind of fasting, does that also put up the M AMPK, which helps with autophagy? Yeah, it does. Yeah, that's that's uh, that is one of the advantages. So if you uh, did if you did say once a month, uh, 48, 24 hour fast, that that is would be also very good. Good. Yeah, I know. Uh, there's a uh, uh, I think his name is Vincent Longo. He's a re uh, longevity researcher at USC. Uh, I think he said once or twice a year he goes on a five day fast. Wow. Well. Doesn't eat anything for five days, just drinks water, I guess it is, or tea or something. Uh, now, that is definitely catabolic. That's tough, right? That's and, you know, if you look at the guy, he doesn't have much money. You know I mean, he's a, he's a scarecrow. The guy has, like, you know, he's like one of these sticks over here. You know, he's not interested in muscle. So as, I wouldn't recommend that for anyone who wants to maintain muscle. But I want, to, I want to quickly add, before I forget, you mentioned about having larger muscles with age. Not necessarily larger muscles, but you want to maintain as much muscle as possible because there's been a slew of studies recently showing that losing muscle, it's a condition called sarcopenia, when you lose muscle with age, has a direct relationship with increased mortality, meaning the more muscle you lose and the faster you lose it, the faster you're going to die. So what that boils down to uh, from a uh, practical uh, sense uh, is that people that don't engage in some form of resistance exercise already have one foot in the grave. Seriously, I mean, I'm not saying you have to go to the gym and work out three hours a day, but you got to do some form of resistant training to maintain muscle mass. Mm -hmm. Can't do it with aerobics. It has to be resistant training. Everybody, man, woman, I don't care who you are. If you're past 40, if you want to live, you know, live as, assuming you're doing everything right, you're not smoking cigarettes 
and eating a lot of garbage. You know, you have to do some sort of resistance training. You really do. It's absolutely essential. They know. They know. They now know that. See, right. in the past, you have to understand. They downplayed resistance. They said aerobic exercise. Forget resistance. Ah, you don't need resistance. You got to do aerobic exercise to maintain your cardiovascular system if you want to live long. And, because cardiovascular disease is the number one killer. And they play down resistance training. Now they know. They're equally important. You need both. Mm. That's what the new research shows. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. With, um, <clears throat> with, with the fasting and, um, the, you know, there's, there's obviously going to be some muscle loss um, as a result of it. Mm. There, and, and, and earlier you talked about these, um, these um, satellite cells. Was right, that, yeah, stem cells, muscle stem cells, yeah. Was, yeah, was it what they, did you call them? What they call satellites? Satellite cells, satellite cells, yeah. satellite cells right? So, with, did if you um, so say for example you fast for a long time, are you actually losing those, mm -hmm. and or do they rebuild again, or like so when you, when you lose muscle, what what is it that you're actually losing? Are you losing fibers? Are you losing like mass to the muscle? And and if you lose it, can you put it? Can you Put it back again. Yeah, there's there's probably a, a, a loss of activity of satellite cells, right? Which will you know eventually equal muscle loss, and also there's a uh, atrophy of the muscle fibers itself from that you know because uh, it's a use it or lose it uh, system. If you don't use the muscle, uh, you lose it. Uh, it just basically fades away. That's right. the way muscle is. Body's a machine from head to toe. Works on a use it or lose it basis. Uh, whatever you don't use, you lose, including brain cells. People that don't read, don't stimulate their brain, chests or whatever, they will lose their brain eventually. You know, they're going to show much more brain degeneration than somebody comparatively who stimulates their brain. And I'm not talking about those brain games. I'm talking about stuff that you're really learning new things, like learning a new language, learning a, uh, how to play a musical instrument. This is like, this is like muscle building for the brain. Because it stimulates, you heard this saying about losing brain cells. Well, now they know that that's kind of been exaggerated. Yes, you lose brain cells as you age. But they found that in the area related to memory of intelligence, an area of the brain called the hippocampus, you can actually develop new neurons. That's, they never knew that years ago. In other words, they now they know the brain has a certain level of what they call plasticity, meaning the ability to kind of renew itself to a certain extent. And you know when you when you uh, when you use your brain when you stimulate it, you know, let's say you've lost a certain amount of neurons or brain cells in a certain area, you stimulate what they call dendritic outgrowths, which bypass the bad neurons and interact with the live neurons. So you, you, it equals you haven't lost anything. In other words, your brain it's kind of like a self repair of the brain. So, but it only happens if you use it. If you don't use your brain. This doesn't happen, and the brain just goes right down. Coming back to the, 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 the conversation we had, so I guess you lose muscle if you don't use it. Yes. Use it. What's the difference between building a sort of a muscle base when you're younger, like in your 20s, and not having that and suddenly starting when you're 40s? Because I, I certainly know for myself, I can yeah. quickly pick things back up again right. in my 40s and 50s I, yeah. I've, I've been I was working out since I was a you know 15 so yeah. you, you can pick it back up where friends that have never done that they, they've got they seem to have a lot of work to do so right. I, if you start when you're younger are you laying the foundations that is easier to build yeah. back on again or is it just a psychological thing that you think you're doing it but you're not no really? no there's a scientific basis to it it has to do with what they call myonuclei which are related to satellite cells Satellite cells work. One of the reasons why they help build muscle is they contribute what they call myonuclei. Muscles are multinucleated, whereas normal cells only have one nucleus. Your muscles have several. And they call that uh, something about the domain. I can't remember the exact term. But the point being that when you work out, you stimulate the development of new myonuclei. Now, if you don't work out, you mentioned about not working out what happens. The muscles will atrophy, but the, you know, they will shrink. Uh, the satellite cells go quiescent, but the myonuclei that you previously developed from exercise remains. Mm. This is called muscle memory. This is an old term, muscle. <laughs> Everybody uses the term muscle memory because they notice that you know you can lay off for a while if you've been working out, and you come back and you, and you gain the muscle back. And they termed it muscle memory, but nobody knew the basis for it. But then they found it was this myonuclei 
In other words, you, you get this myonuclei, additional myonuclei, which as soon as you start working on again, it's like you wake them up. And it's like, wake, and it's, as they wake up, the satellite cells wake up and boom, there you're right back again. So yes, you know, starting earlier. It's a good thing yeah, to, to exa- Yeah, but whereas the person, let's say you, you use the example you used earlier, person who starts 40, 50, he hasn't developed those myonuclei. And if he hasn't worked out all his life and he starts at, let's say, 50, he probably already has a, uh, a, a certain level of satellite cell degeneration, which is going to make it harder for them. To, this is why it's harder to develop muscle as you get older, because the satellite cells are not quite as active. In other words, they, if you continue to engage in resistance exercise, you'll go a long way towards maintaining satellite cells, which is very important for maintaining muscle, but there's still a certain amount of inevitable loss that prevents, let's say, a 80-year-old guy, or let's say, uh, that's too much, 70-year-old guy from looking like a 25-year-old champion, but you can't get that, you know, even if you're the same person, you can't get that same, Frank Zane at 80 cannot go back to the way he looked at Mr. Olympia, because of these changes in the muscle. He could stay in good condition for his age, maintain a a good amount of muscle if he continues, and I know Frank does it, continues to engage in resistance training. But And same with Arnold and all these other guys. You can't get that same look again because, again, there's a certain amount of loss inevitable. But if you've never worked out and you start at, let's say, 55, the degeneration of the satellite cells has already occurred. Doesn't mean you can't put on muscle, it's going to be just much more difficult than a guy who was previously worked out, like the example you used. Right. Okay. Yeah. I want to go on to fat loss, uh-huh. getting ripped, getting in good shape. <laughs> there's a bunch of things. We talked a little bit about fat burners, which I want to pick up again. Yeah. And, and there's also now the the new drug, which I'm I'm sure you know about, which is the semaglutide oh, yeah. version. Right. What what what's your let's start with semaglutide? What's your, what's your thoughts on that? Okay, it really works. <laughs> but let's look at how it works. Now, first of all, I have to say on the onset, semi-glutide, semi-glutide, uh, let me call it. Yeah. I had a little trouble pronouncing semi-glutide. <laughs> and there's a couple others, we, 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 we gavo, we, we, we gavai, something like that. I don't know where they come up with these names, but anyway, the point is that it definitely causes weight loss and almost everybody uses it. What's the mechanism? It's what they call a, a glucagon-like peptide 1 agonist. Gluca- <laughs> let's call it GLP-1. GLP-1 is produced in the body, in the gut. Uh, it's what's called an incretin ha- hormone, meaning it, it promotes the release of, of insulin, which is why these drugs were originally, diab- and still are, mm. used mainly to treat diabetes. Yeah, yeah. They're not, they weren't meant for weight loss. As a side effect... People who were taking the drugs to, let's say, control their diabetes started to lose 20, 30 pounds. And, you know, the drug companies, you know, they always see the dollar <laughs> sign. You know, obesity is a billion dollar business. If you can come out with a drug that really. A pill. Yeah, a pill. I'm sorry, a pill <laughs> that causes weight loss, you got a gigantic market. Yeah. I'm talking huge. And the light bulb went up and said, hey, we're going to remarket this stuff as a, a weight uh, loss or uh, a. But the essential point to remember is that these GLP-1 agonists do not burn fat. All they do is impart a feeling of fullness. They make you feel full so you don't want to eat more. So you automatically reduce calories. See? Mm. And, and, they also, and they do reduce hunger, too, along with the feeling of fullness. Those two factors, feeling of fullness and reduction of hunger, that's what causes the, mm. the weight loss. Great. Uh, it does have a, a, a whole a whole full page of side effects. Right. You know, it does come with side effects. There's no drug. A, a pharmacologist. I looked, heard it is. I got a friend who was a big investor in it and said it was this miracle drug with very little side effects. But um, well, yeah, but it's still. It, you know, it, it. Let me put it this way: a pharmacologist will tell you a drug without side effects <laughs> is a drug that doesn't work. <laughs> Every drug has side effects. Now it's true that they're rare. You know, it's okay. true. However. An essential, there's two essential points that I don't think are being emphasized enough about this. Because Weight Watchers have now partnered up. Oh, everybody's on it. You know, there's three things. I I said two, I'm going to add another one. There's three things people have to be cognizant about when it, uh, by the way, if you know what cognizant means, 
take out your dictionary. <laughs> it means being aware. Of. <laughs> no, the thing is, they, they have to be aware of with these, with these GLP agonist drugs is first of all, they, you have to take them all the time. As soon as you get off them, you know, it's like the, it's like the coach in Cinderella. Remember at midnight, yeah. they turned back into a pumpkin? <laughs> Guess what? When you get off GLP agonists, your appetite comes right back. Ah. So you can put the weight right back on. Mm. Second well, it's, a, it's a perfect business model, I guess, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Second, point, <laughs> second point is the cost. Yeah, it's very expensive. I mean, it's like anywhere from 1000 to $1,500 a month. Mm. A month. And it's not covered by most insurance. It's going to be out of your pocket. And if you want to keep the weight, if you're going to have to take it for life, that's a big investment of money, right? Mm -hmm. That's the second problem, right? Uh, if you're a, di a full-blown diabetic, you could pr you could probably get a prescription from an obviously from a physician. How much insurance will pay? I don't know, but it'll still be. I, I I know that I I don't take that drug, but certain asthma drugs I take. I know that these are so there's one I take that co normally costs thirteen hundred dollars a month. It only lasts me a month, but because of my insurance. It costs me something like two fifty. It's still pretty expensive. Mm. So you can bet that even if you have a prescription for these GLP, when I, they're still not going to be cheap, right? Here's the third and probably most important thing to remember about GLP one agonist: forty percent of the weight loss of people. This is what the studies show. This is going to be shocking to a lot of people. <laughs> forty percent of that weight loss is muscle. Forty percent. Wow. Yes. So is that is is it happening like you said with like long term fasting? Is that the sort of thing that's going on? What's going on is with the reduction of calorie. When you eat less, you're you're, you're also reducing a lot of essential nutrients, including protein. Proteins, right. Your protein can go down like 50, 60, 70 percent. When that happens, there's going to be muscle loss. See, and you say to me, okay, the, the obvious question is. Is there anything people can do about that? Can they take these GLP-1 agonists and maintain, you prevent that lemur? Yes. F very simple answer. Two words. Resistance exercise. <laughs> yeah. Resistance exercise. <laughs> if, you know, they've shown in many, many studies, hundreds, when you diet, when you go on it, whether it's a low-carb diet, a calorie-restricted diet, if you want to maintain lean mass, You've, you have to do two things. You got to increase your protein, and you got to engage in resistant exercise. Essential, essential to maintain lean mass. The same with these drugs. If you want to maintain, I'm sorry, if you want to prevent that lean, that 40% loss of lean mass, you better hit the gym or, or get weights. Do something. You want to use cables? Do some sort of resistant exercise, or you're going to lose that muscle. And when you lose your muscle, you know your resting metabolism goes down. So if and when you right. do get off the drugs. You're gonna, you're gonna blow up like a balloon, real fast. So people have to understand if you're gonna take these GLP, uh, and you know everybody's rushing to get it. Elon Musk took it. He says he lost thirty. You know all these people, you know, the movie stars are all getting on this stuff. Yeah. You know if you want to take it, fine. And yes, I agree. If you if you take, it's only like two point four milligram. You're not the odds of side effects. Even though there's a long list of possible, it's it's not it's not likely, very mm. like unlikely. However. Uh, you better do resistance exercise, or like I said, you're going to lose a lot of muscle, and that's not good. People have to know that, and th and this is not this is not being told to people, and in, in in the in the uh, in the in the zeal to take these GLP. Oh, I want to take it. I want to lose a. Oh, I I can't diet. I I've tried everything, and I, I need you know blah blah blah. Yeah, you know, they they they're not being told about the muscle loss. They need to know this. This is essential. They really need to know this. You got to do. I'm sorry. If you if you don't want to do resistance training, don't take it. Don't take the drug. It's that's. Yeah, I'm telling you, don't take it. And you better also increase your protein. The side effects, then probably, even if you do continue to take it, like that loss of muscle mass over the long period is probably going to very a bad. Lot of yeah. Yeah. And not only, but like I say, you know, I assume that most people take these drugs because they want to, you know, lose body fat. And you know, if you if you take them without resistance training, you're metabolism drops and you don't take enough protein you're going to lose the muscle your rest of the metabolism is going to go into nothing so again unless you want to you know if you want to take these drugs for life <clears throat> you know and you can afford to okay but then again what's that doing you know all that muscle loss what's that going to do to your health mm. 
Remember I told you that muscle loss is related to increased mortality? I mean, nobody knows because this you have to understand, this is a new thing. <clears throat> nobody knows the long-term effects of these glp one act That's another thing. They don't know the long... You, no, nobody's taking this stuff new. for 10, 15 years. <laughs> What's going to happen? Let's say somebody is wealthy enough or is motivated enough, whatever, to stay on this stuff. You know, let's say they've heard that if you get off it, you gain the weight. But okay, that's great. I'm not getting off it. They stay on it 10, 15 years. What's going to happen? Nobody knows. No doctor can tell you that. Mm. Nobody knows. My guess is if they don't engage in resistance training and they don't increase their protein. Now, if you can't eat the protein, because really, this stuff really does knock out your appetite. I mean, people almost have to force themselves to eat on this stuff. That's how powerful it is. I mean, you better at least take a protein supplement. Even if you never take protein, you better take a protein to, uh, you know, and, and engage. You got to do those two things or you're going to be in big trouble. I almost guarantee it. That's mm. my prediction. DNP. Uh -huh. Oh, my God, DNP. Dinitrophenol, uh, dinitrophenol, I think it's called. Uh, two, two, uh, uh, two dinitrophenol, I'm trying to remember the exact. Okay. This is probably, I've called it in my videos, the worst, the most dangerous drug in bodybuilding. The, the, more dangerous than any steroid, any speed, anything. Because uh, uh, just taking a little bit more than the, let's say, safe dosage kills you. You literally burn up from the you, you get because it's a fat, it's a weight weight loss fat loss. It's a, oh, it's drug. it's uh, it works, just like the GLP one agonist. This stuff works. If you th this is one of those things that remember I said earlier that about these people will take a fat burning drug and sit there and not do anything expect that to burn fat. Yeah. This stuff you can sit there <laughs> and not do anything and you will burn fat. You can burn a quarter of a pound of fat a day sitting on your behind if you take this stuff. Sounds good, mm -hmm. but but if you take one drop too much, you, you, your body basically, you, you cook from the inside. It raises your metabolism 50% higher than any thyroid drug. And this stuff, it's an interesting history. I gotta tell you, it's really interesting. Uh, how did DNP, uh, I'm sorry, <clears throat> DNP came about, of course, French munition workers during World War I DNP was used in the manufacture of dynamite. <clears throat> and in these munition factories, the DNP got in the air, dust. The, 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 um, the, the munition workers, factory workers, they were noticing two things. They, their skin was turning yellow, and they were losing a lot of body weight. They were losing a lot of body fat. <clears throat> so eventually, this caught the attention of a couple of doctors, and they isolated to the DNP from the dynamite manufacturer. So in the 20s, they, they decided to, to remanufacture it into a weight loss drug. DNP has the, uh, has the distinction of being the very first weight loss drug in the 1920s. And even worse, it was sold over the counter. You could go in a drugstore, buy it right off the counter. It had about 15 different trade names. But around the early 1930s, uh, much of, but for some reason, it affected women more than women. Young women who were using it started getting cataracts, <clears throat> you know. And I mean, a lot of young young women they're getting cataracts, and it was from the DNP. So what the government had no, government had no protective agency to monitor over the counter drug. Nothing, you know. <clears throat> the government to counter that set up a brand new agency because of DNP. Today we call it the Food and Drug Administration. <laughs> The, the very government agency that monitors all drugs was started because of DNP. And they passed a certain law, a Food Something Act, and it established the, uh, the uh, Food Drug Administration. But DNP then disappeared into, uh, you know, disappeared for a while, for, you know, for years. <clears throat> and then it turned out there was uh, a doctor who, uh, who was, uh, had a weight loss clinic down, in, uh, you know, who knew about DNP. He had a what he called a bariatric clinic. He was treating people who wanted to lose weight. Today, these clinics would probably give out GMP when ag, but this was in the <laughs> 80s. So he, he started giving his patients DNP. And again, most of them were women. I don't know if he got a lot of cash. He claimed that he treated thousands of patients, but apparently uh, there were some medical problems. Uh, and uh, you know he was warned not to do it, but he was making so much money, he kind of ignored it. By then, he had a whole chain of clinics. He's making a fortune because it worked. 
you know, the, you know, the word is spread. Hey, go to this doctor, man. It really, you're going to lose the fat. It really works. I don't know what he's, I don't know what he's giving you. He, he gave it a different name. He gave it his little trade name. But what happened was, uh, you know, a couple of people were getting sick. So the uh, FDA closed him down and he went to prison, lost his license. <clears throat> While he was in prison, he was in a cell with a guy named Dan Duchesne. I don't know if you heard about it. Dan Duchesne uh, wrote a book called The Underground Steroid Handbook in the early oh, right, 80s, yeah. which was the first book which described how to use anabolic steroids for bodybuilding purposes. He was called the steroid guru, which is uh, what they called him. He was in uh, jail with uh, this doctor, <clears throat> and the doctor told him about DNP. So D Duchesne came out, and he got together with a couple of other guys, and they decided they, they, they repackaged uh, DNP and started giving it to bodybuilders, a couple of pro bodybuilders. Sure enough, the pro bodybuilders used it and lost body fat. And they gave him specific instructions. Don't take any aspirin with it. And, uh, you know, don't do this, don't do that. They told him what not to do. Don't, you know, this. And, uh, but what happened was um, <clears throat> the um, Duchesne went to jail for another reason. Uh, I think it was either Clenbuterol or GHP, I don't remember. He went back to jail. And, uh, uh, you know, this stuff, again, kind of disappeared for a while. Then it came back a couple of years later, and it's still in use today by many pro bodybuilders, including one body. I don't want to embarrass him by mentioning his name, but you interviewed this guy. He was a top Mr. Olympia. He, he is very open about talking about his drug regime, but he never mentions this stuff. But how do I know he took it? Because another pro bodybuilder called me on the phone one day and said, listen, uh, blank, blank, told me how he gets shredded the last two weeks before a show. He's, it's DNP. What do you know about this, Jerry? I said, well, this is another top five bodybuilder, a uh, competitor of, of Mr. X, let's call him. Uh, I said, let me tell you, this stuff, if you want to try it, don't take it before a contest because it's unpredictable. I said, when you take it, it makes you feel like you have the worst flu you'll ever had in your life. It takes, it, 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 you, see, you have to understand, Remember I talked about ATP being the elemental source of energy? DNP works by inhibiting a process in the mitochondria, that's where energy is produced in the cell. Uh, it inhibits a process called oxidative phosphorylation, which produces AMP. DNP is like throwing a monkey wrench in the, in the, in the production of AMP, ATP. So what, the body needs energy, so if it can't get ATP, it's gonna go to the next readily available Body fat, mm. that's how it burns body fat. Unfortunately, in doing so, like I say, it causes this increase in internal body uh, heat, where if you, again, if you take a little bit, there was a doctor right around that time in the 20s when they were experimenting with DMP. This doctor in San Francisco, did, he, he didn't want to experiment with different dosage. He used a lower dosage, he, lose, he lost body fat. So what he did is he decided to opt the dosage. So he went into a hotel room and he knew about the, the uh, body temperature changes. He sat in a, uh, a, a cold bathtub where he put ice in <laughs> to prevent the excess rice, and he took an extra dose of DNP. They found his body about two days later, still in the bathtub, and when they did the autopsy, his internal organs were barbecued. They were cooked from the inside. Wow. Yeah, that's what happens when you take DNP. So what happened was, in the last couple of years, DNP showed up on the internet. It's being sold over the internet as a weight loss agent, wow. and about 50 people have died. And these are not bodybuilders. Around. These are young women, young men, who or their only interest is in losing body fat, and they followed the directions. Now, you say to me, wait a minute, if they followed the dosing directions, why did they die? And this is where people have attacked me for what I'm about to say, because I mentioned this in my articles and videos. DMP has a, is a funny situation. Some people have a genetic quirk where instead of being metabolized, the DNP dose stays longer in your body. So if you take it day after day, you, it builds up cumulative. By the third or fourth day, you've now reached a toxic dose and you die. Mm. That's what killed these people. That's the real danger of DNP. You don't know if you're one of those people. There was a famous basketball player years ago, Len something, I can't remember. He went to a party and they were doing cocaine he took, you know, just snorted this. He didn't know that he lacked the enzyme that breaks down cocaine. He genetic mutation. He lacked the enzyme. In two hours, he died. 
This is a freak. Uh, this is a, you know, kind of an outlier situation. You don't know whether you're one of those people that doesn't break down a DNP. It can kill you. I, that's why I still maintain it's horribly dangerous. And I always tell people, you know, I didn't use steroids when I was a competitive bodybuilder. I didn't use any drugs. But I, I you know, I didn't know as much about steroids then as I do today. <laughs> but I tell people that, uh, you know, in, in relation to DNP, I probably admit that if I knew back then what, what I know today about steroids, yes, I probably would have taken steroids. I admit it. But when it comes to DNP, no way. I'd never, I would not put my life on the line. No chance. Mm -hmm. And yes, it really does work. But it's super dangerous. Super dangerous. I wouldn't recommend that to my worst enemy, that stuff. And with the, I, know, I think we touched on it last time, but Which I can't one? totally remember. But you, we, you also, with cancers, in, even in men, uh, prostate, yeah. there's sort of thoughts that uh, high testosterone causes that. Mm -hmm. But, um, and then obviously they, they, you know, reduce the testosterone. But it, I'm not sure whether you would mention it or, or someone else is saying it. Now they're kind of like not totally sure if that is the case. Um, whether, you know, sometimes... You know, if you've got high testosterone, that isn't the cause of prostate. What's, what, what's your, what do you know about that? Well, what they found a couple of years ago was that the prostate gland has a finite ability to accept testosterone. In other words, the, the prostate is set up to accept the normal amount of testosterone that circulates in the body. If you take more than that, let's say you were taking steroids... If you, if you have massive amounts of the steroids, of course, are basically synthetic forms of testosterone. Even if you're taking massive amounts of anabolic steroids, and you have which consequently will produce massive amounts of testosterone in your blood, it's not going to get into the prostate. Because if it did, if you think about it, every bodybuilder, all these pros would all have prostate cancer. Secondarily, who produces the most testosterone? When, when does testosterone peak in men? Age 19. If testosterone really caused direct cause of prostate cancer, every man 19 should be getting prostate cancer within a year or two. It doesn't happen. They have the lowest rates of prostate cancer. So, in other words, the amount, the, the, uh, what they found conversely, and this is rather surprising, is that the, mon, the men who are most at risk for prostate cancer have two problems. One is a genetic risk. That's the first mm -hmm. main risk. If you have a father, grandfather, you definitely are at a higher risk for prostate cancer. Yeah, I do. <laughs> uh, yeah, so. unfortunately. Black men, for some reason, have a higher risk for prostate cancer. Now, the other thing is that uh, if you have consistently, I'm talking years of low testosterone, you are at a higher risk for prostate. Just the opposite of what oh. doctors say. Because they suppress it when you have it. They basically cut, exactly. cut it off, don't they? Right, exactly. So. But the thing is, that's because once you already have a, uh, a let's say, a tumor in the prostate, uh, you know, the testosterone might stimulate. That's why they suppress it. But when they suppress testosterone with testosterone suppression therapy used in the treatment of prostate cancer, uh, it's sad. It's, I, I can, I, the only word I can think of, it's pathetic. About 80% of the men wind up getting cardiovascular disease with long-term testosterone suppression. So they block one thing and they kill you with something else. <laughs> it's sad. I, I'm, I don't think, I'm not laughing. I don't think it's funny at all. No, no. I think it's pathetic that, that, that they have to treat you know, test, uh, prostate cancer by giving you a drug that's going to give you cardiovascular disease by knocking out every bit of your testosterone. It's not a good idea. So, but low testosterone, uh, in fact, the whole idea that testosterone causes prostate cancer stem from one study in 1941 that had only two subjects. First of all, that's not scientific. Any scientist will tell you, you can't ba make a, a basis of, of, of a, a science construct based on two subjects. You have to have thousands, not two. But this, this uh, what they did is one of the guys was castrated. So he had low testosterone, you know, and uh, you know, he uh, apparently had the beginnings of, uh, of a prostate cancer. Uh, they gave him, apparently, I don't know how something happened, where he took testosterone, and it stimulated his, uh, his cancer. Remember, he already had a, a cancer. That he had a tumor going. Mm -hmm. He had what they call a precancer. It's called, it's called intraepithelial neoplasia. 
That's, that's an early form of prostate cancer, which every man gets. Every man gets. There's a saying in medicine, every man who lives to 80 or so gets prostate cancer, but they usually die of something else. Right, yeah, I heard that. You might have heard that, yeah. cardiovascular disease or something else. Every, um, it's just an abnormal cells that, you know, it has to do with cell replication, you know, <clears throat> cell senescence. The cells don't replicate right, so you get these abnormal cells. And they could turn into prostate cancer. This is what this guy had. They gave him some testosterone. He got full-blown prostate cancer. Conclusion of study, testosterone causes prostate cancer. Mm. But they didn't take into account that he had already a tumor in there. So, yes, you give, if you give a person with low testosterone, if you suddenly introduce testosterone, uh, there's a chance, if he already has a the neoplasia in there, he has to have that, then you could stimulate prostate cancer. But in other cases, it's all you're going to do is normalize the testosterone level. It's not going to give you prostate In fact, there's a couple of urologists who are now suggesting, this is kind of shocking, that you can actually give testosterone to people, men that are being treated for prostate cancer. They're suggesting giving testosterone to these men. That would, that would some urologist makes their head explode with it because they've been taught for years that you do the opposite. You block testosterone. You know. So what is your like after you looking at this? What like what what? And I'm not saying this is any medical advice or whatsoever. But what are some of the conclusions you've got that you think over time? Do you think that they may have got that wrong? And over time, they may look at this this differently. Do you think? Well, I I, I think that the uh, idea that uh, uh, I think the major problem is uh, doctors are are uh, indoctrinated. A lot of doctors are indoctrinated because of that study to believe that testosterone is a carcinogen like estrogen. Estrogen is a carcinogen. Testosterone is not. Mm. There's no evidence that testosterone causes cancer. Well, there is for estrogen. So they're hesitant to give men who need testosterone, who are clinically deficient, as shown by those three testosterone tests, they won't give it to them. I went to a doctor years ago, uh, and, and uh, you know I, I'll tell you a quick story. I had taken a testosterone booster Myself, this was sent to me by a guy who said, Jerry, it'll raise your testosterone. I was about, about 45 at the time. He says, it'll raise your testosterone, no side effects. And I trusted the guy. Sure, send it to me. I took it. And, and, you know, sure enough, I got stronger. My muscles were growing. Oh, this is great. I'm taking, I'm getting a steroid effect without taking steroids. Unfortunately, what happened was uh, uh, I noticed that uh, my tes testes started to, shrink, which is a sign of <laughs> testosterone suppression. That means your natural testosterone is... Be when you take exogenous testosterone from the outside, your body stops producing gonadotrophins. Remember we talked about last night, like which cause your body to produce that. It turns off. So if your testes aren't getting that, it's like, again, they use it or lose it, they, they shrivel up. Mm. And I was concerned about that. So I, I, you know, I, I consulted a uh, doctor... I said, listen, uh, I, 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 asked, oh, I, I, I left something out. I found out that the supplement was what they call a designer steroid. He didn't tell me that. It was an actual steroid. This is, I admit, this is the only time I ever took steroids in my life. I admit it, but I didn't know, I didn't know it at the time. So I consulted this doctor, and I said, listen, doc, I told him the story. I said, I would like to get on, uh, I don't need to get on testosterone therapy yet, but could you put me on a course just to normalize it? Because I took a testosterone test, and the do another doctor called me two days later and said, Mr. Brain, and we got the results of your testosterone uh, test. He says, you have the same testosterone level <laughs> as a seven-year-old girl. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, wait a minute, hold on a second. I knew that you needed testosterone to build muscle, and at that time, I was still interested in building muscle. So I, I met with this doctor. I said, look, can you put me on at least a temporary course of test just to get it going again, you know? <laughs> He says, he looks at me, he says, I wouldn't put my, my father on testosterone if he showed no testosterone. He said it just like that. I said, why? He said, don't you know what causes prostate cancer? And I, even back then, I knew that was false. The, 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 the uh, studies that I mentioned earlier about, you know, having the prostate have a finator, they were just coming out at that time. I said, you're wrong. He said, he goes like this, he says, Really? 
He says, I went to Stanford Medical School. Which medical school did you go to? That's what he said, exact words. I said, okay, good, sh good enough, I'll tell you what. Are you a betting man? And he looks at me, I said, I'll tell you what, I will bet you 10,000, bring a witness in. I'll bet you $10,000, I'll bring a, a, in a box of research showing you're wrong. And he just, he just, he just, he just looked at me and, and, and walked out of the room and slammed the door. <laughs> That's what you're dealing with with some doctors. Right. I tell that story to show. In other words, men, this is the problem. Some men who really need testosterone replacement therapy aren't going to get it because it's a prevailing notion that testosterone causes prostate cancer. It does not. However, if you're, again, starting out, let's say you've had low testosterone for years, you do have to be very closely monitored because, you know, if you have that interest, you know, that neoplasia effect, you, you, could, you could possibly get prostate. Mm -hmm. So yes, if, you, if you're going to get on testosterone therapy and you've been low on testosterone for a number of years, you have to be very closely monitored right. just to be safe. Yeah. So there's a lot of information and a lot of research that you're doing all the time. You've got a fantastic newsletter. Yeah. To, just just uh, for those of you who don't know about it, um, can you tell us a little bit about what you do? Sure. I don't like to call it... An, uh, the original name was Applied Metabolics Newsletter. And I... Freely admit, I, I wasn't thinking. Um, I wasn't thinking clearly when I gave it that name. <laughs> the applied metabolics is fine because that basically tells you what it does. It, it, it gives you uh, it, it's the application of practical metabolics. In other words, it gives you uh, techniques related to nutrition, exercise, and health that you could use in your daily life that'll really save you a lot of money on supplements, improve your exercise efficiency, help you lose body fat, maybe possibly slow the aging, all that stuff. It's all practical. I don't like to call it a newsletter because most newsletters I've seen are like these two pages, pieces of crap that don't give you any information at all. They're always free, and they have to be free because they're not worth a dime. I wouldn't put them under a birdcage. All right, maybe that's a little mean. I shouldn't say that because I probably insulted about 100 guys by saying In other words, they, they don't give you any practical information. So I just call it now Applied Metabolics. It's like 30 to 50 pages every month. Uh, it's, I, I always warn people, it's very in-depth. In other words, I do a tremendous amount of research when I write these articles. I cover the waterfront. It's great. Any person who wants to know everything about any particular subject without having to have an extensive science background. See, I, was a, I wrote for magazines for years. I know how to write for the public. I write on a sixth grade reading level. Not, I'm not saying that I write for mentally retarded people. What I'm saying is that I write in simple English you don't have to have a medical dictionary to understand. And people could use it right away. Uh, it's, a, it's literally life changing. It's even changed my life. And, and the thing is, what's interesting is every time I research for this uh, publication, I learn stuff myself. I, I actually learn, I, and, and I always say, no matter what your level of education, no matter how many PhDs, MDs, if you read Applied Metabolics, I guarantee you will learn something. Mm. I guarantee it. Even some of the, a lot of the things we discussed today a lot of these so-called health professionals have no idea. I guarantee it. I promise you, they have no idea of what I'm, uh, of what we were talking about. Mm. But this is the kind of stuff I impart to the public, you know, in, a, in applied metabolic. It's not expensive. And I, I said it would be worth thirty or forty dollars a month, but you're 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 giving it away. Yeah, it's ten dollars a month. I mean, <laughs> I, I've kept the price. I've had it now. It's going on its ninth year. I've never raised the price. Everything around me has gone up. In other words, the price of maintaining the website, everything, you name it, has gone up considerably, as you know. You know, everybody knows with the economy. It affects me. To, everything has gone up, but I've tried to maintain that price because I want to get as many readers as possible mm. because I think it would help a large number of people. Yeah. I really do. It's a, um, great, it's a great publication, yeah. and it is really, for what work goes into it, is an absolute yeah. steal for anyone yeah. that's interested in a lot of what the sort of thing we've talked about yeah, today. I, I mean, I've had people, some people can't have canceled. And, I, you know, I was curious. When I first started the newsletter, you know, I, I would write to them. I'd email them and said, uh, could you tell me why you canceled? I want to possibly, if I'm making a mistake, I want to improve the publication. Every time it was always the same answer. Uh, I canceled. It's great. I love it. Best information I've ever seen. I just don't have time to read it. It's always, every, even today, I still get that. I don't ask anymore, but people will s send me an email. Jerry, I have to cancel. I love your newsletter. I just don't have time to read it. I'm still, I got one just the other day. Still get these things all the time. And it, it just boggles my mind because who says you have to read? 
one sitting. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to read 40 pages in one sitting. You could, you could, you know, there's a program in uh, Microsoft, uh, whatever it's called, the operating system, where you could actually have it read to you. Mm. You don't even have to read it. <laughs> and, and, you know, I say, you know, learning, they've discovered years ago, if you really want to learn something that's really intensive, it's best to learn it in chunks. In other words, don't try and memorize a bunch of stuff. At one, just do it a little bit at a time, and you'll get better attention. That's probably the way. That's the way you should, probably should read applied metabolics. You know, but it's again, if you have a super short attention span, you know, if if like reading two sentences makes you cross-eyed, save your money. It's probably not for you. But... Not for you. No, no. All right. Yeah. Well, well, Jerry, thank you very much. Sure. Right. It's been a great, great, very, I always, uh, I, I always learn so much and feel there's so much I don't know. I don't know how you keep all of this stuff in I your head. I don't know myself. <laughs> <laughs> but thank, thank you again. Really sure. appreciate your time. Thanks. Always great to talk to you, man. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you've got any value from it whatsoever, then please do us a favor, like, subscribe, tell somebody, and that will help us to be able to continue to do more of these and help you escape your own personal limits. Thanks for listening.